Hi guys, I'm Andreas Menke from SSW, and I'm here at NDC Sydney 2019. I'm joined by Philip Ekberg, and he's gonna show us all about C-Sharp 8 and beyond. All right, I'm Philip, and I'm really happy to be here. I love being at NDC Sydney. It's my second time coming here. I used to live in Sydney and work with all of these amazing people here, so I'm really happy to be back, being able to talk about the things that I love, which is programming in C-Sharp and working with all of these amazing .NET features. So I'm really happy to be here. You're really the C-Sharp guy. Well, people tend to tell me that I'm the C-sharp guy, but I know I, I don't <laughs> identify myself as being the C-sharp person, you know, but I do like to dabble with all the things C-sharp and .NET and mobility and Azure and all of those different things. Well, perfect, because I'm actually here to ask you about what's new in C-sharp 8? Sure. Um, and maybe have some cool new demos that we can go through. Yeah, of course, yeah. So we're going to go through a little bit of C-sharp 8 and possibly talk a little bit about what's beyond C-sharp 8 as well. So let's move into our first demo. Sure, so one of the newest features in C-sharp 8 is one of the things that allows us to avoid null reference exceptions. So one of the biggest problems in software development have over the years been that we get nulls in the language, and when we get a null reference exception, that kind of costs us a lot of money, right? Because we lose maybe users, or we lose income, you know, it depends on It's a million dollar question. Exactly. So one of the things they've added to the language is now a capability for us to opt into something called the nullable reference types. Okay. So that allows us to look at all the reference types in our application as non-nullable which means that we then have to opt in to say, well, this string, for instance, or this person, or this object, is now capable of being null, but we interpret it by default as a non-nullable object. Okay, cool. So how about we jump into the code and have a look? Sounds great. Yeah? All right, so we're inside Visual Studio, and I'm looking at a normal console application. Right, so this is applicable to all the different types of applications, no matter if you're working in you know, WPF, or, or in, in ASP.NET, or in a console app, right? So now what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to change this application by going into my, my project file. And I'm going to go into this project file. And you'll see that I have a section here called nullable. I can now change this to enable this new feature. Right, so it's either disabled or enabled. Right. And now what I've done here is that I've enabled the nullable reference types for my entire project. And is this enabled by default? For new application? No, so it's disabled by default, so you have to opt into the feature right now. But we don't know what's going to happen in the future, right? So they could have this enabled by default in the next version of C Sharp. We don't okay. know. And I think it's a, you know, they decided that adding nulls to the language was probably not the best approach, right? So it's introduced all of these different types of problems and applications, but now we have a way to opt into the feature. Although when we enable this here, it won't automatically just throw exceptions. We'll have to go through our application, and we get warnings that tells us that you have poten potential problems here. So we set this to enable, and now let's jump into to the console app and have a look at how that changes our application. So we have this normal person class here that we are kind of used to in our applications. Regular DTO. So, yeah, regular DTO, or whatever you want to call it. So we have this, this class here. And now what I can do here is that I can say that either I opt into saying that my string here is now null, right? But you might have noticed that we get a little squiggly here telling us that well, this thing here is now expecting us to set the name in the constructor, right? So that's interesting. The constructor is now telling us here, or the warning on the constructor is telling us that this DTO or this instance here will have a property that is probably uninitialized. Right. So the way that we can solve this is by saying, well, I'm going to inject my name here into the constructor, and then I'm going to set this property here to make sure that whenever you create an instance of this, it has to be initialized. Have a proper initialized name here. So and the warning happens, got away. Right? So what happens if you put no in the constructor? Well, then you will get the warning somewhere else. Right. So it follows through the rest of the application. It follows through, right? So what's interesting here now is that we changed the contract for the application. And you might not always want to do that. So in order for us to get rid of the warning in this console application, we need to undo this here because we don't want to break everyone that's using our class person. So now what we do here is that I'm going to say that, well, name here can in fact be null. And now we got rid of the warning inside my class. But then you can see here that all of a sudden we get squigglies on other places in the application. So I'm using this, this method here called insert.update. It takes an, a person. In this case here, there's no question mark, right? So this means that the person will always be instantiated. Right. We won't be passing null in here. But we get a squiggly here telling us that you have a possible dereference of a possible null oh. object, right? Mm. So what we need to do now is either we fix this by saying, well, I promise that this if, if we run towards looking for properties on our name here, it's not going to be null. And we have this, um, this uh, we can do the question mark, like we've done in the past. Right? right? For anything that's null, we can say, well, if it's not null, go ahead and give us the property after that, or call the method, or whatever you want to call yeah. it. But we can also say that, well, I know better than the compiler, and say that, you know, <laughs> this is not, in fact, going to be null. 
right? Because in some cases, what happens is that you might have a method call on the line above, which then sets this value somewhere else. And the compiler would probably not be smart enough to always figure out those cases. Right. So this is a shouting at the compiler, I know best. Yeah, exactly. Um, although you should probably avoid doing this, because the compiler most of the times know better than you. <laughs> but you know, what's also interesting here is that we can check if, if person.name is equal to null. Then we're going to return out of this context or this method. And now it would, in fact, know that you've done a null check at the line above. Cool. So IntelliSense is smart enough to know yep. when it's null. Cool. It's pretty cool. And now if we say that I know that person here is can be a null reference, we're now going to get us quickly here in our if statement here as well. OK. And we can apply the same nullability checks for everything. Now this here tells us that you might have a potential null reference exception. It's, it's not a guarantee, right? right? Because it depends on what you pass into the method. But it gives an indication of some of the problems that we can you know, face in our applications. Now, one thing I'm thinking of, how does this affect third-party libraries? So the third-party libraries will now have to introduce this, of course, in their own libraries as well. And if, if you start passing down null references into the, those um, packages, of course, you can't be certain that you won't have any problems. This here is not a guarantee that it won't break any things, right? Because you can always say that I promise that this here is not going to be null. And if you're doing that, even though in a third party library, like you can't really promise that there's not going to be any null reference exceptions. Right. So you should always pretty much guard against null references, anyways, I reckon. So this here is not going to be foolproof or you know, solve all the problems. But it'll give you a handy warning to tell yeah. you when you should take care of this null reference exception. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So let's move on to the next feature of C Sharp. Yep. Uh, the new feature, async streams. Right. So you know, async in a way it has been this thing that they've tried to improve with every version of C Sharp. When they introduced this back in the day, they made it easier for us to work with asynchronous programming. But there's always been things that we want that make it easier for us to build even more asynchronous applications. Especially with all the packages out there now leveraging the you know the TPL and the async and our keywords, we want to make sure that we can get the most out of it. Perfect. So with that. We get something called the asynchronous streams, which allows us to fetch data and process the data as it arrives to our application. So we can think of you know, fetching bytes of data over the web and process the bytes as they come into the application. Or we can think about loading things from the disk, for instance, or a database. And we process the items as we load them from our disk. And we could do some processing off that. That takes a little bit of time. And we use the asynchronous operations all the way through. But when we finish, processing one of these items, we can display that in the application. Right. Right. So let's have a little, little bit of a look at a simple app. Let's jump in. So we're going to have this console application, but this here is applicable to all the different types of C Sharp 8 applications. With that being said, you know you need to use .NET Core 3.0 in order for you to leverage this language feature. Right. Okay. Which is pretty much the same for all the C Sharp 8 features, but some of them will compile on the .NET full framework, but it's not officially supported. Right. So if you want to jump onto the C Sharp 8 features, you should jump onto .NET Core 3.0. No. It's a good, good reason for you to rewrite the entire application <laughs> and hire good consultants <laughs> to do that, right? Hire SSW. SSW All right. here for you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So in this application here, I have a simple asynchronous main method. So that's one of the language features they introduced in C Sharp 7, point, yes. one of the point releases. And now this allows us to have an asynchronous operation inside our main method. And you can see here that we have an await keyword in front of this for each loop here. Looks a little bit different from what we've seen in the past. This is a new method of writing a for each loop that supports async. Exactly. So look at this in the manner of for each item that my for each loop is going to iterate over, each item is going to be an asynchronous process or an asynchronous way for us to retrieve that data. So you know, in the past, we've probably said something looking like this here, where you say, get all the chunks of data at once, or mm -hmm. whenever everything's yeah. processed, we go ahead and iterate over those items. So you have to wait for it first. But this way seems more performant. This way is probably more performant, or at least it appears to be, right? right. The processing will take the same amount of time to do, right? Because, you know, but you can stream it back to the user yes. faster. So it appears to be quicker, and you can, you know, have a fun with the user interface and allow the user to process the, that data in, in the UI, depending on the type of application. Cool. So not only does it change the way that we use this asynchronous stream inside with our for each loop, but it also looks a little bit different if we jump down to the method that's use, leveraging this language feature. So of course, we mark our method here as async. And that allows us to do asynchronous processing and introduce the await keyword. And you can see here that we're not returning a task or task-like object. We're using this new thing called iAsync enumerable. This is a new type of C Sharp 8. It's a new thing that's coming with C Sharp 8 or .NET Core 3.0 that allows us to now say that I have an enumerable here where all the items are going to arrive asynchronously. 
right? So then we say, in this very simple example, we are simply iterating over zero through 10, and for each item, I'm doing a little bit of processing, right? So this, each item is going to take us about 300 milliseconds to process, and then when we've done that, we're gonna return that item using yield return back to the caller. You know, cool. yield return has been around for a long time and be used in a lot of different cases, right? So in this case here, we can now say, return the item back to the for each loop. So do we want to, want to run this application and see Let's how it works? Let's do it. Let's do it. So we're now running the application, and we can see that it now streams out the numbers to my console here. That so tells us that so we're printing the data after the data comes yeah, through. Yeah, exactly. So let's run it again. So we can see that each time we get the data after about 300 milliseconds, it's going to show each of these items in my application. And you know, if this was a WPF application, we were loading things from disk and displaying like stock data, for instance, we could be displaying each line by line. Right? Perfect. So what would be a more real life example you'd use? Well, except the um, the stock example, I have a, a little bit more of a real world scenario here. If we have a look at a way for us to process data from the disk, for instance, it's a very common thing that you want to do. You want to load some large data or some large file from your disk. You want to process each line Maybe asynchronously, you want to start off a parallel process, or you want to do something with that data. Now, what I'm doing here is that I'm using another feature that I wasn't supposed to talk about, but I'm using this enhanced using, where I can say, I want to introduce this using declaration here to say that whenever this method completes, it's going to dispose of whatever I have here, right? Whichever thing that I, the I disposable that I'm using here. So it's like using using for the whole method instead of having to define it starting end yourself. Exactly. So a little bit more readable. It's all about making code more readable and maintainable, you know, easier for all of us developers to build applications. So now I'm loading this, or I'm starting up a stream that opens up the file, allows me to start to read the lines asynchronously, right? So I can read each line asynchronously. That might take a little bit of time. It's super quick on an SSD drive, right? right. But if we're working with, you know, old bands or whatever, sure, yeah. uh, that would take a little bit of time. But that's very, very, a very small time that it takes. So for each line, I'm retrieving from my disk here, I'm going to do some processing. You know, If I'm loading a particular, let's say that we have a file of, of different stocks or ticks for a particular stock, we might want to go ahead and query a web API to get the actual stock data. So that this here could be actually querying, querying an API, storing something in the database, hmm. something that takes a little bit of time. A bit of computing power there. Yeah, exactly. Something that would potentially lock up our UI. Hmm. But then, of course, when I've done that processing, I want to return the final result, which in this case is simply going to be the lyrics. I'm going to pass it back to whoever is calling this here. Cool. Right? So let's run that example as well. So I have the exact same thing. I'm just going to comment this code part out. And we have the same thing. We have an await in front of the for each. So I'm saying for each line that I can retrieve out of my method, I'm going to asynchronously wait for each line to finish processing. And then I'm going to process the data and show that in my application. Let's give it a go. I'm going to run it. So now, if you can figure out which song this is, you know that you've all been rickrolled. We're no strangers to love. Yeah. Do you want to <laughs> sing the entire song? I'll, I'll leave it to the computer. Yeah? <laughs> Perfect. All right. So that's the asynchronous streams that were introduced now in C Sharp 8 with .NET Core 3.0. It's a fantastic new feature. Yep. Let's move on to the next feature, um, pattern matching. Right. So pattern matching was one of those features that they introduced in C Sharp 7. And, but they've made it better in C Sharp 8 and kind of drastically changed the way that we can use it or in the way that we really want to use it. Right. And it kind of improves the way and the experience for both the developer, the maintainability, and the things that we can do with it. Okay, so cool. let's uh, look at some code, right? Right, so pattern matching allows us to look at a given object and match that by particular traits. So we could be looking at which type it is, which is a simple thing we could do in the past using an if statement, mm -hmm. say if this type is equal to type off. Yep. Or we could have, or now in, in C sharp seven, we can say, based on a switch block, we can say if it's the case is being a triangle or the case is being something else, we can do certain things, right? Yeah. But with C sharp eight, they introduced two things. The first thing being a switch expression, which is a new way for us to write the switch block, but instead of having to do the case and break, we simply have an, an expression. Right. Which is really nice. It's yeah. going to be looking much more functional and much more like F sharp and other other functional <laughs> programming languages. There's newer programming languages. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And then what they've also introduced is something called recursive patterns, which allows us to not only look at the type, but also look at traits of that particular type. It could be looking at how does this look if you deconstruct this object into different parts? Are those parts equal to whatever I expect them to be? If they are, I'm going to catch that in this particular block, and you know, I can do some processing right. on that. So inside the switch statement, you can step down the object parameters exactly. and check out those yeah. values. And you okay. can do that in different manners. So 
The first thing that we can do here is that I've introduced this switch expression here, which is simply saying that based on my shape here, and what's interesting with the shape here is that I've said that this is an object, so it doesn't have to inherit from the same base class. We can run a switch that now looks at the particular type, and it doesn't matter if they have the same interface or the same class in common. Okay, cool. Which is kind of powerful. Um, right, so in this case here now, I can say based on my shape here, I want to run this switch expression, which we have here, right? Now, I can say that in, in case this being a triangle, and when two of my sides are not equal, I'm going to return this string here from this method. Right. That's, that's pretty standard. We've been able to do that for a long time. But now when this becomes interesting is when we introduce something called a tuple pattern. Right, so let's have a look at what that looks like. So tuples was a new feature in C Sharp 7? Yeah, exactly. So tuples is a way for us to kind of construct a type, but not having to create the class or a struct or an anonymous type. So we can define this container of fields, which I'm doing here. So I'm saying that we have this container of fields. I'm going to have a field A, B, C, and then we have this discard thing here at the end. So what that means is that we're going to first look and match at the particular triangle. So I'm going to say whenever my shape is a triangle, and when that object can be represented as this tuple, I'm going to run this particular block. And the way that it generates this particular tuple is if we have a look at the triangle itself, it has this thing called a deconstruct. So a deconstruct is a thing that they use together with tuples. And the tuple here that we generate is simply saying that we have the A, B, C sides, as well as a point to where this triangle is going to be positioned on my screen here. So you have to implement this deconstruct method. Right now you have to, but in the future, hopefully we're going to get something called record types, which we might have a little bit of a look at. And that will introduce this R for on its own. That sounds very powerful. And that would be very great. So that's our feature I really want. So if someone from the C Sharp team looks at this, please go ahead and implement that. <laughs> so now what this means is that whenever I can deconstruct this thing into a tuple that this matches like this here, we're going to run this or return that string here. But what the discard here means at the end is that I don't care if the point was an instance or if it was null. I could be very specific and say, I really only want to match this whenever my point is actually a null object. Right? Or the discard feature is just, it could be anything. It could be anything. And I think that's pretty powerful. So that's a tuple pattern. It makes sure that it first looks at the triangle, then recursively looks at how do we match this particular type into this particular tuple. Kind of cool. Very and cool. then the next thing that we have is something called the positional pattern, which is also leveraging, leveraging the tuple. So just like I could say null up here for the last parameter, we can make sure that each, each value that we can deconstruct into has these particular values. So in this case here, I'm saying that when I have a rectangle and all of my sides are null, or I think it's the x and y are null, we can have a look at the deconstruct. So that's the, oh, actually, it's the width and height of my rectangle, and then I have a point to where it is on the screen, right? So whenever I can deconstruct it into something where width and height are both zero, as well as I don't care if it's being positioned on the screen or not, because this is an invalid rectangle. Right. So this here allows me to, to match on that particular case. And I could say that for all the rectangles that are 100 or 100 and by 100, we would now match on this particular thing here. And that only matches on the exact value? That matches on the exact value. So if you want to say that we have a rectangle that has a, uh, let's say, forever case, this is a rectangle. And when the, let's call it r, when r dot, dot width is above 100, we can now do this thing here. So if you want to say, whenever the width is above 100, you have to use this width expression here. And what's interesting here is that this here captured this as a local variable. Much like we saw up here where we, we deconstruct into this tuple and we create these two, these three local variables, a, b, and c, we can use them inside the expression. We can do that as, as well as down here, right? So we can say r is now going to be our strongly typed rectangle, which is cast, right? right? So that's and really that's used within the context of the case. Yeah, Perfect. exactly. So it won't leak out anywhere else because that would be dangerous. Mm. Now, the next one they've introduced as a, is a recursive pattern is something called a property pattern. So if we have a look at this here, when we don't have the capability of adding the deconstruct to our objects, we might still want to be able to say whenever our rectangle has a particular width, we want to match to that particular thing. So I can now say that when it's a rectangle, I want to check the property called width and make sure that the value is 100. And then I'm going to capture that as a local variable and, you know, then we have our, our width that we can We can use that local variable in the case set. Exactly. There we go. And then, of course, we can say, I want to match this to any type of rectangle. And we can also say that we have a default pattern, which will, as a difference to using a normal switch, this will also match on nulls. Right. 
So in the same select statement, you can use all of these different patterns and combine them together to get really powerful performance. Exactly. So that's really one of the main things, right? You, it doesn't have to be the same base type. You can look at different types of traits for that object. You can look at the properties and you can look at the, the tuples that de that's deconstructed. So it makes it really, really powerful. So I think we should look at one more example that will show you how you can combine this using a tuple and then how we can use the tuple pattern to, to match on that. Let's do it. So I have this, this example here. It's maybe it's not a real world scenario, but it kind of gives an idea of how we can use this in a in a real world scenario. So I'm constructing a tuple here based on an HTTP response message. So I'm saying based on the status code, and if the status code was a successful status code, I'm going to run this switch expression and match on on different types of um, of status codes as well as if it was successful or not, because I want my application to work differently based on if it's returning a not modified, if it's a 200 OK, or any of the other 200 OK status codes, right, from the 200 range and up. So based on that, I'm going to get rid of this final one there at the bottom. Right? So what happens here is that I can now say, create this tuple and match it to the tuple that we have here for our switch. So I'm going to say that when we have the status code not modified, and if it's the status code is it's uh, successful, which I know it will be. So this is a little bit of an over-engineered way of doing this, but it just illustrates how we can leverage the tuples and the tuple pattern. Then I'm going to load my data from the cache. If it's 200 OK, and I don't care if the underlying thing says that it's 200, like it's a successful status code or not, but we all know it is. So that's why using the discard. I could be very explicit and say true here. Yes. No. Yeah. But whatever. So then I can also say that. This, in this case here, we extract it from the message. And then for all other status codes that are also a successful status code, I can do this thing here. And now I'm just extracting the shape out of my status, out of my HTTP response message. But what I could also be doing is storing this to the cache. I could be doing lots of other magic for all the other ones, right? But then where it becomes interesting is that I can say, well, only for the request timeout, and I don't care if it's a 200 or if it's, it's above that, I can say that I want to recursively run this method again. Okay, right? cool. So that's pretty cool. So I can I can leverage that, and for all other, you know, all the other yeah. 400, 500, and all the other ones you don't want, we're just going to throw an exception, and whoever's listening for this can can handle that properly. That handles all cases that are for a successful status code or just any other status code. Correct. Yeah. Well, it's a good example. Yes, yeah, so I think it's it's a really. It's a really powerful thing to have in the language. And you know, pattern matching is one of those things that we've seen in a lot of different programming languages, like everything from F sharp to Swift to Kotlin, and it's used different by di differently by different developers. And I think it's making the language more powerful and it's gonna attract people from all over the different types of, of paradigms. Yeah, and getting them to use C sharp. Yeah, exactly. So now we've looked at some of the new features in C Sharp 8. Yep. Perhaps you can speak a bit more about what's coming next in C Sharp 9 or 10 or what's sure. coming after that. You know, the thing is that we don't know if, if all of the features that we're going to talk about are going to be in the language or not. But one of the things that we've talked about for a very long time is record types. The record type is something that I know they've wanted to introduce for a long time. Since C Sharp 6, where they started to rewrite the compilers, using the new open source Roslyn compiler that allows them to write everything in C Sharp, which is much better, right? So what they wanted to do even back then was introduce this notion of allowing us to describe our objects as records. That means that we can take this thing, which in this case is a simple DTO. We have a triangle, it has a base class, it requires us to specify A, B, and C, and in this case we have three read-only auto properties. Now how about we make this a little bit easier on the developers? Because you know it's it's all about saving the amount of characters that we write when we write the code, and if we were able to simplify this into simply saying, how about we we get a record, we call it a triangle, and we require a, b, and c to be entered in the constructor, that would be pretty cool, right? Very now you would probably expect that this here generates the exact, exact same thing, right? But it generates a whole lot more. So if you look at this here, we can see that it introduces the auto properties, or the properties that are purely read-only. It also introduces a constructor that allows the, us to inject A, B, and C by default. And set the values. Exactly. So you're you're implementing the I equatable as well. Exactly. So this here now allows us to say that we, we can check this against another triangle, which will not just check it against the instance. It will also match on the different properties, right? So since we know that we have A, B, and C here, and they're required for a triangle, we can check the quality on those different properties. Cool. And that's pretty powerful. That allows us to 
just make our lives a whole lot easier. Get rid of the boring boilerplate and get us exactly. get on with our jobs. And you know, one of the, one of, another really common problem is that you try to compare two instances to each other, and you might expect them to implement the I equatable, but they don't, and you have a you know an obvious mm. bug in the application. Yeah. Another thing it also implements is this thing called the with method here. You can see that we have the with method that returns a triangle, but what it allows us to do is to say, I want to get this particular triangle with a different type of value for either the side A, B, or C which means that we have an immutable triangle, and to get a different triangle out of that, you have to create a new instance. So it's like taking a copy and then modifying some of its properties. Exactly. Because we are in a world where we really don't want to mutate our objects, especially not when we're working with parallel programming or asynchronous programming, where things can come from different places. We want to make sure that no one's going to change this object without giving us a new one or without us creating a new one as well. And then, of course, we can see the deconstruct at the bottom as well, which is now giving us this way of you know, deconstructing this into a tuple, which allows us to use this for pattern matching, and now mm. it becomes really interesting. Very so, easy to use. Exactly. And the, the hard thing about implementing record types into the compiler is because it's hard to figure out what, how do they solve this for inheritance. So if you have one record and you inherit another record, they're both immutable. How do you make that work in that, you know, the experience with the developer in a nice manner? Right. Okay, cool. So hopefully we're going to get this finally, but you know, we, you never know. <laughs> you never know with the C Sharp 18. Exactly. The next feature that I would like to talk about in the next version of C Sharp, which we don't know if it's going to be called C Sharp X 10 or 11, they they kind of have this. When it has a weird name with number nine. Yeah, I don't know. L let's see what they're going to call the next version. Maybe we're going to be sticking on C Sharp 8 point something for the rest <laughs> of the time. Who knows? So. That would actually match what they did with Windows, right? Right. So we'll see what happens. So one of the things they're going to introduce is this target type new expression. The target type new expression allows us to be a little bit less explicit when we're creating our types. So let's look at this example here, for instance. Instead of having to write var triangle is equal to new triangle, I can now say triangle is equal to new, or triangle of triangle is equal to new. It's a little bit different. We simply move the triangle, you know, the, the name of the class to the left-hand side. Right. But What's interesting here is when we look at the dictionary example at the bottom, right? Because what it's doing now is that we're saying, give me a new instance of, of this dictionary of string and list integers. And you can and then, figure out what's the target type exactly. it should be creating. And then inside the collection initializer, we do the same thing. We're saying, give me a new thing of whatever you're expecting, and it just allows us to add those different values in its own collection initializer, right? Wow, that's a powerful feature. It is, but it does require them to change the runtime. And they haven't been able to change the runtime for a very long time because it's been tied to .NET full framework, and you know, that that thing that is, is... Big glove. That is, whole, yeah, yeah let's, uh, yeah. Let's move on to <laughs> .NET Core, right? So with .NET Core, it's much easier to get people to upgrade to the later version and to get new features into the runtimes. I'm actually very impressed that they made the uh, the thing so you have to use .NET Core 3.0 for C Sharp 8. I was expecting a lot of upset people about that, but people seem to be understanding and understand that they're not going to be able to backwards port everything, right? That's going to be impossible. Yeah. So I, the you know, I kind of welcome the the changes to the runtime as well, and I mm. I reckon that if they were doing you know async and await now instead of having to done that years ago they would have done it differently. Because right now, async and await are just compiler magic. But if you were able to change the runtime, they could do a whole lot of interesting things. Well, thanks for joining me here at NDC Sydney, uh, Philip. I um, hope you guys took the best you could from Philip's wonderful demo. Thank you so much for having me. And if you want to learn more about C Sharp and the things that I do, check out my courses on Pluralsight, and I'll be answering any questions that you might have around C Sharp, C Sharp 8, C Sharp 9, and whatnot on Twitter. Perfect. I've been Andreas Linkick from SSW. Thanks for having you guys.